you're listening to the Holt Center Podcast. On today's episode, Rich Hobby interviews Ensemble Meek Nawuj. Hey, this is Rich Hobby with the Holt Center. Um, we're so lucky today. We've got uh, two members of Ensemble Meek Nawuj, an amazing hip hop and classical group that are coming to the Holt Center uh, in early February. So uh, welcome to the show. We have uh, Juwan and Sandman. Yo. Hi. How are you? Excellent. Well, yeah, so we're so happy to have you guys and very excited to have you guys coming for the show. And um, one thing I just wanted to do was to kind of, uh, if each of you could kind of give us a little introduction about yourselves um, and kind of like your musical history. And why don't we start with Juwan? Okay, so uh, my name is Juwan Kim. I'm the artistic director and composer for Ensemble Meknewuj. And uh, I've started this group, I guess, 12 years ago. Gosh. Time flies with uh, our um, executive director, Chris Nicholas. And the genesis of this group started when I was uh, at uh, Conservatory, San Francisco Conservatory of Music, doing my master's. Uh, I did a piece that had hip hop and chamber music in it. And I did it to basically demonstrate against the uh, oppressive aesthetic of concert music which I wasn't connect, connecting to at all at the t- by the time. And uh, so I wanted to shake things up and added MC at the end of my piece. And everybody got mad, especially the teachers. But to my surprise, we got a big uh, full page write up on Oakland Tribune, which uh, was a very respected newspaper at the time. And uh, my MC at the time suggested that we make an album. So I spent next six months writing about an hour of music, not knowing exactly what I was doing and had to seriously rethink about my sort of career as a composer because I was, I mean, I still think that I'm a serious composer, but I I just really wasn't a hip hop head. Let's just say that. And then uh, subsequently I got into hip hop and uh, basically had a, Eureka moment or like a conversion moment for me, which came when I was listening to NWA and it was this specific piece after police. (laughs) And I I felt like I was dipped into the river of hip hop and reborn as like a free musician. So that's, uh, I think that should do it. Excellent. Well, yeah, I, I, I love the NWA story. And I think it's, it's amazing to hear that that story is still kind of a catalyst in many ways, uh, decades from, from its original release. Uh, but Sandman, why don't you give us a little rundown of uh, your involvement? Yeah, um, I, I guess, uh, you know, my beginnings as an MC were with a, a group called The Attic. It was a local Bay Area group. Um, essentially, we, we kind of all met in high school. Um, and we, we all met in high school and were kind of, you know, I guess you could say in a sense, hip hop nerds and that we really love to to kind of research all of the different independent and underground artists that were out there. Um, I was introduced to a radio show that was out at the time called The Wake Up Show, which was a show that came on from, uh, it was, I, I believe it was 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. every Friday night. And so we would listen to that. You know, on regular radio, you know, they would just play like the, mostly the pop artists and, and then, you know, the, the nationally or internationally syndicated stuff. But there you got to hear just, you know, everybody who was out there doing something. In fact, that's the first time I heard Eminem when he was just really just a battle rapper. He had never really put out an album. Um, you know, I got to hear most deaf before he came out and, and Talib Kweli and, and also got to hear uh, KRS-One do interesting things. And then also, you know, one of uh, innovative artists and, and artists who I feel like uh, from the independent perspective um, did something great and tech, you know. And so I just got to hear all this, this is when I fell in love with hip hop It was kind of like ninth grade. And I was like, wow, hip hop can kind of just be anything, especially from an NC standpoint, because I, I got to hear all these artists who were just really playing with the craft or not playing with the craft, but but experimenting and doing different things. And so, uh, you know, we uh, we 
began to perform, became 18 year olds, you know, uh, got a little bit of notoriety. And then like many groups, I come up, we kind of had a split. Um, and then in my late twenties, we kind of reformed the group and that a performance, uh, is where, um, uh, we, well, uh, one of the MCs was already performing with Joan, but he introduced us to Joan. And then that's, uh, kind of how our relationship started, went over to his house and had some tea and, uh, you know, started with one song, which was a uh, first song, um, and went from there. Excellent. Well, cool. Well, one thing I think we would love to kind of get a grasp for is what is uh, an ensemble McNabu show like? Like, what what can people expect? What's the energy in the room like? Okay. So, well, oh, yeah, go go ahead. I go? No, no, no. You can go. Go go first. Well, no. I, I, what I can say is that you know, even something I learned from, because, you know, when, when uh, I began doing this, you know, it was, it was totally experimental for me. It was just like, okay, it's something different. Try it out. Um, and what I noticed is that it, it kind of didn't matter whatever crowd we were in front of from, from young to old or, or, you know, any race, didn't, like people just loved the m- music. It was moving. It was, it was high energy. Uh, um, it was. It always had an introspective element to it, and we found that people weren't sure what <laughs> just happened uh, because they'd never seen anything like it. But they were like, you know, that we always got this in- incredible response. Um, so you could definitely expect a lot of energy. You know, there's there's a lot of energy in in Juan's music, um, but there's there's also points of reflection. You know, um, points that 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 feel healing or have a, a resolve and it's very you know, it's almost even uh narrative based and so you kind of feel like you've been you're you've been taking on a, a bit of a journey um and so we always get uh, incredible responses from from crowds uh they're they're all based on those individuals reference for music because they need a reference for us because they, you know we're kind of the only people who do um you know, even though there are people out there who call themselves hip hop orchestra, like our the, the the sound here is entirely you know our own. Um, so you know, some sometimes you know, one time we were doing a show at um, at the Cathedral by the Lake in Oakland. It was a fe- it was a festival, um, and there was this older eighty year old gentleman who was who was kind of sitting in the front row. You know, and we we were doing what to me was a hip hop show. And so I had never performed in front of like an elderly crowd. And so it was very weird for me and it was odd. And I, I was like, I, you know, this isn't a good idea. You know, that's what I initially felt. But, you know, we went on with the show and, you know, one of the MCs was like, throw your hands there. And he had his hands in the air. And then he comes up to me after the show and he's like, I really enjoyed all the, the music, the instrumentation and, and your skin adding and it's so like the only reference he had for what i was doing because he didn't listen to hip-hop himself was you know i was scatting you know um or there was another gentleman who came up at a different show i forget exactly where it was um we were definitely out of state but he was like you, you know you guys are like the first time i saw the whalers and like okay we, we sound nothing like the whalers but you know it, it, it and what he's describing is like a, a, a transformative effect i guess you could say and so uh, I, I guess that's what people can expect. Lots of energy and to just see something that you've never seen before. Excellent. Juwan, what do you have to say? Well, actually, he touched on the things that I wanted him to talk about this thing uh, that he just described. Uh, two things, actually. One is the age barrier. I, I, can, I, I always remember when uh, Sandman, Ed, to me, told me about that this music actually crosses the generational gap because he's performed in front of a bunch of different races. That's not a problem because a lot of hip hop has younger people, you know, of any race love hip hop, but it's this, this is distinctive because it actually crosses that generational gap. And in doing so, we cross a bunch of biases that each generations have. And then, you know, kind of like bring, it's a cliche to say, but actually bring people together they actually enjoyed some thuggish looking latino you know tattooed gang gang guy 
would be like right next to a tuxedo wear, I'm sorry, not tuxedo, but regular, you know, uh, semi-formal wearing, you know, white dude with a glass of wine, glasses of wine on. So that's important. And then the second thing that he said, the point of reference for people for this music is very varied. It's simply, it's, it's almost like, I don't know whether you uh, have heard of this uh, phenomenon, like when Columbus came to America, the native uh, Indians could not see the, uh, uh, the ship because they just have never seen anything like that. So they were like, they just didn't see it. That's why when, when, even though the music has a lot of impact, the form is very new to them. So people are like, oh, it's like Whaler. Oh, it's like scatting. You guys did a great scatting, guys. Or somebody would point something that is like part of the classical sort of uh, 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 reference that I'm doing. So it's really interesting to see that um, how this music kind of like triggers people in different ways. And I think that it's, what I can say is that the, the whole point of us doing it is to actually invent new form because there's a whole sort of uh, uh, academic sort of focus about decolonization of thoughts. And it actually came out of the, you know, colonial uh, resistance against the colonial like residues like from Africa and such. But I think it's really important, especially now that the diversity and you know, uh, identity politic is kind of used in a way that to divide us. But in this case, our differences actually invent new things. And the mechanism is what we call meta sampling, so. Oh, that's fantastic. And that's, that's just the kind of events we like to kind of have at the Holt Center where you get to kind of fuse and, or create this opportunity for different audiences to kind of meet in the middle. One side of, uh, or another side of why we wanted to bring you all to uh, the Eugene area is that uh, with this show, you also have a, a number of education workshops that will be happening. So would love if you could just touch on, you know, why do you do education workshops? What's the value of doing those kinds of things and, and interacting with students? Well, yeah, so, uh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll I'll say this just because of of somebody you know my my you know origin of, of discipline you know as an artist is is hip hop, and I, I you know in the media you hear hip hop spoken about in in a variety of ways, but never as to what it actually is, right? And so I, you know I hear you know like you know, there was you know I remember a long time ago it's never left my mind because I remember watching it like Oprah was having a show and then like you know her position is hip hop is violent it's misogynist and it's um, and it's it, and, and I'm like well no I mean there's a reflection of that because people who are the artists in hip hop come from from that sort of environment, but hip hop itself is a, is a contemporary Renaissance art culture. And that's actually what it is. And so there are very crafts uh, that exist within it and it, in which anybody can participate. And to say that it is just this one thing is, you know, extremely limiting and, and, and really just wrong. So a, a lot of what you know I like to do when I talk about hip hop is to is to really you know help people understand that hip hop actually wasn't any of these things until the industry got a hold of hip hop, and then the industry you know chose and cherry picked everything that was most sensational, that was most violent, that was most optimistic, and everything, and then even and even then why judge those artists in that way? Like for instance when. Scorsese puts out a film that has misogyny, drug use, um, violence, uh, you know, and, and, and even racism. We don't say that oh, he's all of these things. What we say is, no, he's an incredible artist because he's shown you something with his craft and filmmaking. And so then there's never this, this uh, I feel like there's a, there's a lack of opportunity for people to look at this from of it being a craft uh, especially when it comes to to uh, uh, 
uh, rhyming because if you look at uh, you know rhyme and meter, is that hip hop is actually hip hop music is actually adva advanced it, but we don't like to look at it from that lens because it's there's just a judgment of its content and the content in and of itself is very if if especially if you go outside but it's just uh mainstream so uh this is this is generally when when i talk about hip-hop and, and have uh educational courses um what i like to highlight okay so i i think that that's a i think he put put the nail on the head i think that um the framing of hip hop as this like misogyny and like filled with materialism and all this stuff is very not the, the essence of hip hop. The essence of hip hop in our mind is method sampling. What does that mean? That means that you can actually sample anything that's available to you and by reframing them, creating new work. And much like uh, producers actually take snippets of the uh, recordings that they could find in the crate and then they actually stretch them they slow it down or like make it very you know uh, fast and so on and so forth and create new pieces and we do it um, we actually extrapolate that idea and we actually now sample rationale sample methods so and then once I start seeing this way I start seeing this pattern everywhere and like, you know, I, I obviously there's uh, gastronomy, examples of gastronomy, like for instance, like guy goes to France, learn all these French techniques, come back to United States, open a burger joint, but he would like sous vide the hell out of the burger, so on and so forth. So, and then when you do that, do you call it, is it like American food? Is it French food? No, it's just new kind of things because you learn something that wasn't here at, as a convention and you break the convention and then you actually create new, new stuff. So this is why in, in teaching people about um, the kind of music that we do, I think it's actually a larger project because what we need right now is not just to like go with this one ideology or left or right, this, these two uh, two polarities uh, are like good or bad. I think they're all bad right now because they simply because they can't really invent new things. And we believe that method sampling can actually, you know, uh, usher in like more inventions. And then in order for us to invent, it requires diversity. It requires something foreign, right? By the virtue of it. So in doing so, we can satisfy the need for like having, in, including everybody, but also satisfies the need for this growth and like rebirth and so on and so forth. So that's the point that I re am really focusing on. And as for me as a composer doing this is that really American classical music has two kinds of like flavor that goes either with the Nadia Boulanger school where you learn the techniques and then you actually apply it ironically, Quincy Jones studied with Nadia, Nadia, as well as Philip Glass, right? And then all the other like Copeland and all these Americana people. But the, the other side is this German sort of, uh, um, you know, like serialism school, or in some ways like French school of like doing the spectralist stuff. These things, aside from Nadia Moulanger school, which actually has a real application of like either pop music or at least Philip Glass, his music is all like, you know, in pop culture because he actually does film scores. All the other stuff, like German French, like super high art music, these things do not connect with American people simply because it's really one sort of uh, frame. Like it's a Euro European sort of thing, right? So I think that it's time for us to actually create new music that can be radically inclusive and innovative and working um, in the world now, which i.e. generate income for the musicians so that they don't have to apply for grants. It's actually supported by the people. Yes, fantastic. Well, uh you know, I, I think you guys even touched on this a little bit earlier, and, and I think this kind of one through Fred in here, especially like with the meta sampling with that is kind of some of the influences um, that that have impacted you. Um, and I was wondering if each of you could 
um, kind of talk about both a hip hop song and a classical song that you found like had an inordinate impact on you in a unique way. Um, and yeah, how about we start with uh, Sandman? Oh man, a hip hop song and a classical song. Well, I mean, the, the classical song is is easy because you know, like you know, I I I, you, I love Bach. Even though, you know, I uh, guess uh, technically Bach is Baroque, not part of the classical period, but in in the in broad terms, I'm talking about classical music, um, uh, Bach's music is is my favorite. And when I first heard Takata and Fugue, like that's the, you know, that was like, oh my gosh, that made me like, okay, well, what else is out there? Just because it was in, it's incredibly dynamic. Now, I had only heard it in snippets and pieces before you know it everybody's heard that but like it you know it's been ever you could find it anywhere in pop culture but when i actually heard the whole piece all the way through i was like this is incredible you know in fact this could if it were made now you know i feel like people would be incredibly drawn to it you know um so there's that in terms of classical music and then hip-hop is difficult because it's you know, there's there's so much. Um, <laughs> uh, well, even if you can't get it down to to a song, um, even I just uh, I had this moment of where I actually put on most deaths black on both sides for the first time in probably you know five years. But there, I had a person in the room with me who had never heard it, and it just like every song just clicked in more and more for me about oh my god, there was a time where this was the like always in the the cd mixer right like there was those certain cds that never left you know that thing was, was there any album like that that just made such an impact for you well you know uh that you know uh uh outcast at aliens was was an album like that for me you know i used to listen to that over and over just because they they um you know big Boy and uh, uh, Andre, Andre three thousand. Uh, they they used to just play with the styles, and they said they were MCs to me who just had like a, a real idea for craft and doing something entirely different. Nobody else sounded like them, um, and so I just used to love to listen to their music. And then also, the, you know, they were you know produced by. Uh, organized noise and you know which was an you know an actual band and so it, it also had very much this this soulful feeling to it and so i used to play that album um uh, all the time um in my young young younger years in fact it was it was actually one of the first two cds i ever bought so um so so yeah I, you know i can't pin down an Zach song. I think I think Return of the Gangster is one of the most you know incredible songs in hip hop. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think a, yeah. Anything with Outcast you can't go wrong with. But how about you for Juwan? Uh, classical um, and and also like we don't have to be so specific. It can be a composer uh, or and an album uh, that you found impacted you. Well, obviously for hip hop. I mean, I would I would have to pick two sort of influences in hip hop. Like ob obviously, it's Dre N.W.A. type of like G funk thing, and especially N.W.A. The uh, Straight Outta Compton was like a transformer transformative album for me. And um, um, but also Jay Dilla. Jay Dilla for me in hip hop, he's like Thelonious Monk. He's like Mozart. He's the person that actually truly sort of looked at the production of hip hop and like transformed it into a, an actual art form, right? It's not just like, I mean, obviously no, no dissing everybody that's came before him, but it's for him to do all this like uh, without, uh, uh, basically he played the drums. Uh, there's a technical term for it, like without quantizing, he played the drum machine 
as if they are all instruments. So he made it organic. There's always this loose sort of like floaty feel to it, but also always kind of like moving forward. And his phrasing is odd. And like, uh, there's a piece called E equals MC square, which has like two four bar in the middle of it. Obviously he makes it into four, four, like, you know, in, in, yeah, in aggregate for like five, uh, four or five bars, whatever. But then it's really weird if you actually listen to it and it's like, but just like Monk's music, if you listen to it, it sounds really smooth, which is exactly like Mozart, ex exactly like Bach. Um, and for me, for classical, it would have to be Beethoven because when I heard Beethoven's Symphony Number no. Five when I was ten years old, I kind of realized that, you know, this was serious. <laughs> so cohesive i mean i i sat through the whole cassette tape when i was in korea right so and then i found out he was deaf <laughs> and i was like what <laughs> so that's why i would have to choose beethoven symphony for number five and uh nwa dr dre slash j dilla well th those are definitely some clutch uh selections uh i think also naming j dilla i think you just earned a lot of hip-hop uh, credit for 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 all the 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 purists that i know out there um because yeah uh, donuts was a phenomenal album and it definitely like uh just one that still is in heavy rotation even on my own turntable so i uh, can't agree with you more there who's going to be on stage with you guys uh how many uh, musicians are going to be on this tour with you so we actually have augmented our group generally we have 10 piece now we added like string quartet and um and then um, French horn and bassoon. So there's gonna be four wins instead of just regular two wins. So we have what, like 15 piece crew. And one of them would be turf dancing and not a musician, but a turf dancer who is actually legitimately way more famous than we are. He works with like Britney Spears, but he loves us. So he's coming with us. He's, he's been performing with us for a couple of years now. So it's a bona fide chamber orchestra with full string section al although it's not like full full but it's string quartet and a bass and then we have four winds and french horn with the body and we have amazing drummer and i will be performing playing the piano and then conducting and mc sandman will be on the mic just spitting truth and fire and then we will have a soprano so well, excellent. And have you had a chance to perform uh, since the pandemic has started to kind of loosen up? Yeah, yeah, we have. We have. What was that first, you know, getting back on stage? Did you have uh, butterflies return or or was it just like getting back to normal? I mean, it was it was kind of like knocking some dust off a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, just because we were so used to performing, you know, we would we would perform. We were performing often uh, prior um and so yeah so so for me it, you know even though you know crowds gen generally don't notice when you make mistakes but you know it's like oh my gosh I'm making mistakes everywhere but but yeah it was it, it was kind of knocking some dust off it it was it was a lot better for the second performance though but the first performance back well you know I just noticed like wow it's been a long time <laughs> you know so well I mean I, I was actually going to quote him uh, base, basically after the show he said um i didn't know how i forgot how healing this thing was that's what he said that's what sandman said to me remember oh that? Yeah. yeah 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 so i mean it was spiritual experience it's like you know uh, it, it it was performing in front of people and then actually sharing and then a bunch of people came up to us and they said like, thank you for coming. This was so needed in Reno. This is so not like Reno. I don't know what that meant, but I was like, okay, thank you. Yeah, there was a, this is so not like Reno. It was a group thank of ladies who was like, this is not, this is not <laughs> Reno at all. And that's what Reno needs and like something like that. But yeah, yeah I was like, okay, what is, what is <laughs> Reno like? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there, it was, it was something a little bit more cryptic and deeper going on there, but yep. you know, um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I guess that's also part of it. I think, 
take for granted if you if you're performing all the time i think sometimes you take for granted the the fact that you're able to perform and and, and what it what it does for you um as an artist you know and then you you know and then when it's taken away from you um and then you're able to get back to it you're like wow this is uh, i guess this is why i do it huh <laughs> you know and so yeah Excellent. Well, that's a that's a beautiful sentiment, and uh, and we've seen it, you know, ourselves just being in the hall and and seeing people just coming back to the shows and and seeing that excitement on their faces. So, um, so we're very excited. We have you guys on February eighth uh, on twenty twenty two, and we encourage everyone uh, to come out and check out this amazing show, um, and also go online and find all the amazing videos uh, that and songs that are available from uh, from this group. Um, and just like, yeah, I encourage everyone to, to come and check it out. So I want to thank you both again uh, for finding some time and uh, connecting with us. And uh, any other uh, notes before the show? Uh, no, maybe uh, I, I'm really excited about going back to Eugene because uh, we went there a long time ago uh, before we had Opus 3 as our agent. And then we performed at this place, but it was it was like a country music kind of looking venue. And certainly people looked very not like hip hop or, or classical people, but they enjoy the hell out of us. <laughs> and uh, it was a very interesting experience. And oh, it, 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 very, it was Cottage Grove. Cottage oh. Grove. Yeah. I'm so, yeah. Cottage Grove. Yeah. Cottage Grove. It wasn't Eugene, right? It was a, it's a different city. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah different yes, city. No, yes, you're right. Yes. Uh, that's and that's right. that's just yeah that's just down the the way from us but yeah 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 so that, yeah. that's amazing but yeah we'll, we'll, we're super excited uh to have you guys come up here and we'll have to show you how eugene rolls we'll see you guys on uh, february 8th and um yeah we're really excited for it okay all right thank you thanks for tuning in for information about this show and other upcoming events check out holtcenter.org